All right. Well, welcome to this Tuesday night session talking about the 2020 Virginia storm station season. We're, we're glad to uh, present this to you, mainly because the, all of us are suffering from SDS. That's called supercell deprivation syndrome. And we want to talk about storms, although there won't be any here for a while. So we're going to uh, just kind of toss it around to our four different storm chasers here. We'll each talk about a specific instance that we were involved in, a storm that we saw. And uh, and then we'll maybe ask some, each other some some questions. I'm sure I know uh, Bill and Justin are going to talk some about the same setup. Uh, I'm familiar with Roman's uh, talk because I chased the storm west of him and it kind of almost like a, a passed the baton to him. So we'll have some good times talking about it. Um, so let me just as as we get started here, we'll start with uh, with Bill Hark and have him talk, introduce himself and talk about his storm. Well, hi, my name is Bill Hark, and I'm a storm chaser. I'm based out of Richmond, Virginia, and that's what I do on the side. I'm actually a, I'm a physician, and I see allergy patients. But anyway, I, I chase in the mid-Atlantic and out west regularly every uh, every season, except the COVID kind of clipped my wings this year. But I did chase um, and uh, did find this uh, one interesting chase day, and this was back on uh, September 3rd of this past year, and I will put it on... Uh, uh, we'll do share screen here and take a look. And can you all, uh, can you all see that? And, um, it looks like, um, this was back on September, September 3rd. And, you know, already in the morning you had a nice, uh, marginal risk, um, over, uh, uh, DC metropolitan area. Now I'm, remember I'm based down in Richmond. It's about 100 miles to the south. But I made sure I took the afternoon off to uh, to chase this event, and uh, it had a pretty. Uh, um, let's, see, let's go back here a little bit. Um, you know, if if you look here, you had you had, you had a nice. Uh, well, first of all, we had a marginal risk and a 10 percent. Uh, uh, tornado risk right over the DC metropolitan area, which is not my favorite place to chase, but uh, you know, really had no choice. And if you look at the uh, setup here, um, you've got uh, got this nice trough um, with pretty strong winds, almost a little bit of a divergence here. This is looking at the 500 millibar chart right over the Northern Virginia um, into uh, Maryland. And um, so that was kind of my, my target area. We had a, a decent area of, uh, of Cape and uh, southeasterly surface winds. Uh, 850s were from the southwest, which is not my, my favorite. Um, I usually prefer uh, south to south uh, easterly 850s, but uh, can you take what you can get? Still was pretty good chance for, for a good shear, and uh, Capes were going to be up in the, in the thousands. So let's go on to the next slide here. Sorry, it's moving a little slow. Uh, let's zoom in up. Uh, here's the surface, and um, you can see kind of over. You can see there's sort of a uh, sort of a a weak front across, going from east to east to west. Um, we've got southeasterly winds in central Virginia, and then going up into the D.C. area. If you, if you go further up into uh, northern Maryland and Pennsylvania, your winds are more uh, uh, southwesterly. So I'm sort of targeting the area with the most backed winds. And uh, this, if you look here, is, gives a, gives a nice plot here. You can see the front draped over the uh, Northern Virginia uh, DC area. Okay, it's been a little slow here. It's not wanting to pour the sides. Um, okay. And then this, this shows a little bit of your, your helicity here. And then you see you see there's a nice demarcation of, uh, of your uh, mixed layer cape. Uh, it was up in the uh, 2000s over the whole area, up right about the Maryland-Pennsylvania uh, border. 
And again, I, I wanted to target just just south of that uh, south of that line. And uh, if you, this is just one of the examples. Or her has this her has this nice uh, uh, isolated cell um, over actually just south of DC area on uh, different runs. It was kind of it was all over the place, but showed some isolated convection uh, would be just ahead of the the other storms, um, Northern Virginia, uh, Southern Maryland. Um, I initially earlier in the day was hoping for south of DC, but further um, further data showed it was going to be really just on the other side of DC or maybe even the DC area, which I, again, not particularly fond of chasing that area. So I headed uh, headed north, and if you look at this uh, uh, radar screen here, um, you can see I'm in a little blue circle. And I went up 95 up toward uh, around DC on, on the Beltway and luckily didn't get hit in any major traffic. If you look off to the west over the mountains, you can always see storms forming. And I was hoping something in sort of a, a performance of the trough just to the, the east of that. And as you can see, there's already a, an isolated cell there. And that's sort of my target area is one of these isolated cells. Um, here's a uh, XM. Um, if you look on the screen there to the, to the south of me, south to the south uh, east, that's, the Was that's Washington, D.C. So I'm in Maryland, and I'm targeting this initial storm um, kind of ahead of a main line of storms. And, you know, I was hoping to get it isolated before it would get embedded in the other, other storms. So as I'm in Maryland, I can finally make out a base off to the uh, north. Uh, northwest, I'm heading toward Mount Airy. So you can see an even, maybe even a little bit of a, a lowering there. So at that point, I'm getting pretty excited. This is about mid-afternoon. Um, eventually, it starts to get this kind of hook hook formation. And, uh, and of course, you got to be careful up there. They have photo, ra photo radar. There were signs that would say 30 miles an hour and uh, photo enforced. And uh, I uh, almost got caught a couple times, so you, you got to be careful up there. So eventually it has this nice lowering, and I stopped to watch this uh, wall cloud for a while. And uh, nice, pretty, nice, pretty wall cloud. It was showing some rotation. And uh, then I figured I'd maybe get, see if I can get a little bit closer. It was starting to move towards some, some hills and lose my visibility. So, so I, I continued northward. And it got it got uh, uh, severe warned, and the sort of the hook area was going to move a little bit north of the main road there. So I headed toward uh, toward Mount Airy, pretty pretty area around there, and uh, so I wanted to get in in front of the in front of the storm. Let's see, and then it became a nice tornado warning. You can see the hook off to the off to the um, west and um, you know navigation at this point was fairly difficult these are kind of windy roads up there there's a lot of trees and i wanted to make sure that i you know sort of got in front of it but not got um, not have it go on top of me so at that point i'm kind of sitting uh, nicely in the in the hook there and it's wrapping around uh, uh, very nicely this is just to the just to the west of mount airy it's moving at, at a pretty good clip. I'll pull up a velocity there. Um, you can kind of see a little, it's not the greatest rotation, but uh, there's a little bit of rotation there. And you can kind of make it out through the trees. This is looking, uh, this is looking to the west. And uh, it kind of initially looked sort of linear, but there was this kind of lowering area. And that was kind of my, my target. Uh, if you can look at it here, it's uh, contrast is enhanced. You can kind of see this lowering. Again, it's kind of windy roads there. So another contrast enhanced picture. Still tornado warned. So here's a, a, a threat net view. A uh, little rougher graphics, but this is a, something I can easily glance at while, uh, while driving. I don't have to uh, you know, hold a phone or anything. Um, but you can see, uh, you know, it's got a nice core off to the off to the uh, west. So eventually, it 
sort of dissipate a little bit and pass to my north and you can kind of see the kind of a lowering right there and I followed it toward the east and I'll show another another picture here it's got almost got it's just sort of a, a clear slot there and this was rotating a little bit and then it started to fall apart and so I meanwhile there were storms forming to the south so I kind of decided do I keep following this eastward or do I drop to the south? Uh, I watched it for a little while and it was kind of starting to dissipate, but the main concern was it was heading toward the Baltimore uh, metropolitan area and I really could not chase it across there. Now, as I was dropping south, uh, you can see there's a much larger storm coming off from the, from the southwest. There's Baltimore right there. If you look to my north, there's that little core right there it actually started to cycle up again as I was heading south and uh, it actually exploded over uh, the Baltimore area and uh, apparently the reports of funnel clouds and it was tornado warned again as it went, went over uh, downtown Baltimore. Um, obviously I couldn't follow it there. I tried dropping south to get in front of this storm but at this point it kind of turned into an embedded mass of, of just rain and, and mess. There were some further storms down in Virginia and so because the main interstates were blocked were blocked off with traffic at this point we're getting toward rush hour i basically cut through uh, washington dc area and uh don't usually see the washington monument on a storm chase but uh kind of got this cool shot of the of the monument with dark uh dark clouds around it that was kind of a fun uh fun shot so i dropped um dropped south and as you can see there were more storms forming in Northern Virginia, but by the time I got down there, it uh, it dissipated. Um, another storm uh, later on, much further to the east and outside of my range, did drop a tornado and had this nice, uh, nice couplet there. And if you look at your uh, uh, storm reports, uh, you had a nice uh, one, despite a 10% risk, we had just, you know, one uh, reported tornado and uh, never didn't see any good pictures of the tornado but uh, certainly it was a good it was a good chase it was worthwhile uh, um, going it was nice to get out and uh, and chase some things so anyway that's that's about it for my uh, uh, for my presentation well, I can certainly identify with the traffic up there. Having lived in Fredericksburg and chased out of there for a number of times, number of years, there was many times I just kind of waved bye-bye at stores, storms when they went by north of there because I didn't chase. Probably the line between Fredericksburg and Manassas was about as far north as I would go because the traffic would be horrendous. So I, I fully understand that. <laughs> you know, there, there are parts of, I mean, there's some nice parts of Maryland. If you go uh, northwest of D.C., you know, there's some like, you know, sort of flat areas, there's clearings, there's farms. And so it, it's pretty good uh, chase areas. The problem is some of the speed limits are pretty darn low. And again, you got those photo radars, so you, you better obey the, obey the law. Exactly, exactly. Okay, Bill, well, thanks. That was, that was cool. I, uh, I haven't seen storms like that around DC for a while. It was good, it was good that you caught those on the, on the chase there. Thanks. Well, next we have uh, as our presenter, Justin Buczynski, and I'll let him introduce himself and talk about his storms. Hey, so my name is Justin Buczynski. I'm a Virginia Tech meteorology student. And while the semester is going on, I'm based out of Blacksburg, but if it's over the summer, maybe the spring especially, uh, I'm more focused around the Danville area, so Southside Virginia. Um, so let's see if we can get this shared application window, PowerPoint. So the chase that I'm going to be discussing is from September 3rd, 2020. Also the same setup that Bill Hart just described, but I was chasing on the south or south of DC. Um, we didn't want to venture up north of DC. So at day two, the setup, I mean, it looked all right and there was a bunch of hype around it on Twitter, but being based out of Blacksburg during the school year, it's going to take a lot to go to Nova. However, the SPC delivered with an enhanced over Northern Virginia 
marked by a 10% tornado bullseye right around D.C., northeast through Maryland. Now, the 10% bullseye was really appealing at first. However, you have to remember, these storms are coming through in the evening. Um, traffic in that whole region in general is going to be awful around rush hour, and then you add in a big conglomeration of storms, and the traffic maps from this day ended up looking horrible around D.C. and Baltimore. So we made a wise call by not pushing farther. So our target area ended up being just south of D.C., right where this enhanced kind of merges in with the slight. <clears throat> Any farther north, then the road networks got bad pretty quickly. Um, so the day of, the SPC puts out a tornado watch, and they uh, discuss how thermo, uh, thermodynamics are definitely worthwhile, especially in uh, Virginia. We had 1 to 2K uh, mid-level cape. Um, however... Dynamics, the best dynamics in particular, Maryland, um, so very far southern Pennsylvania, and then as you go into Delaware and southern New Jersey. So we're running a bit of a risk here. We don't have as much forcing with that short wave slipping just to the north. However, thermos, if anything popped, we figured that, you know, we'd really be in business. Um, and they also mentioned how lapse rates are non-existent, which is true. If you went to the SPC meso-analysis, there was absolutely nothing for low level, and I think mid-level maybe had a six, 6.5 degree area right around there, but it, it was pretty poor. So now we're at the day of, this is my only radar grab from the whole day. It's a life lesson here. If you're chasing, please take screenshots of your radar. You'll thank yourself later. Um, this is our first and arguably best haul of the day. Um, we are just south of Leesburg here. And uh, cells had been back building one by one by one. So this one that you're looking at right now from a distance had just started to mature. And you can already see another one forming to the southwest, which is going to be the story of the day for the most part. But you can see, I mean, there's not much structure. It's classic mid-Atlantic chasing conditions. You got trees, plenty of low-level clouds. I mean, you can see some lowering, maybe a bit of a shelf cloud. Maybe just we're just going to call it a lowering because I just don't have enough detail in this picture to really be able to pick out what I'm looking at. However, we get to a better position, and this is a wide-angle shot from Mark Overbeck, and this is where you got to witness some maturing supercells start to spit out a bit of a lowering here, a bit of a wall cloud. Uh, you got a nice turbulent updraft base, and uh, I should add, this is the first time, this is my first year chasing ever, and this is the first time I've ever seen a supercell and really been sure that I was looking at a supercell. Um, it was really great structure to look at. If this will play... Got a nice time lapse of the supercell here. So you got broad, broad rotation with a turbulent updraft pace, and you got this lowering that slowly started to grow and snake along the bottom of the storm. And again, that was also really cool to look at. This storm did not end up producing, however, you know, it was just very, very pretty quality storm. Very glad we caught it. Um, here's one more capture. Uh, this one's from Peter Forrester. So I also forgot that at the beginning. This chase was with Mark Overbeck and Peter Forrester. Both are really good storm chases, and I'm really glad I got to go with them. Um, a bit of post process or post processing here, but it really highlights the structure well. So we got, you know, again, everything I've pointed out before. Heavy, heavy precip off to the right. Overall, though, quality storm. And a, a fun fact I can mention is I don't know if I have a picture of it in this presentation, but the stone wall right here. At one point, I tried to get uh, my footing on a pillar get a better view of the storm and get a bit of an angle over the clouds or over the tree line my bad and uh my foot slipped and i ended up really tearing up my right side um i didn't include any pictures of that because that's just not what we're here for but it was not a fun time and it it, it uh dampened the storm chase for a good half hour after because i had pain radiating through the right side of my body but you don't want to stop if it's not a serious injury we have supercells going on in front of us. And September Nova supercells aren't exactly commonplace in this region, so we really had to seize the opportunity. But here's one final picture. This stone pillar right here actually is exactly where it happened. Uh, there's Peter Forster right there. Um, note, note the rolling shutter on the iPhone. I actually did not chase with a DSLR or any type of camera this year. Thankfully, now we have one, but it, it does definitely dampen the photos. But this is as the... Uh, the storm began to transition to be more outflow dominant as it congealed, but there's all the other storms that are around it. So afterwards, we headed uh, southwest, so we're you know, hopping on the tail end, Charlie, the storm that was forming to the southwest earlier. We get a view of a nice lowering from a distance, you know, potential wall cloud. Um, but as we got closer, here's a better shot. 
this storm had already begun to decay, and by the time we got closer, it was um, no visible structure. But this is probably the best view of the structure on the storm that we did catch. And so right here, you know, it's still to lowering. So that's our second storm of the day. And overall, you know, not bad. It's definitely nice to see a bit of a lowering. I'll never complain about seeing just a random lowering, you know. And so uh, at this point, we head back to Wawa as we head south because all these storms have slid through D.C. They slid northward. And we are not willing to push that, especially with it already being four to five o'clock. If we want to get back to our homes, you know, in Roanoke and Blackford and Christiansburg, by any sort of sensible time, that was just off the charts. Once so we're sitting here while I was looking south and cams had advertised maybe an isolated cell or two in northern Virginia, down towards central Virginia. Um, however, as the day had gone on, it just wasn't materializing. There was a cap that just had not broken beyond a certain point. However, around 4.35 o'clock, this change, you see we got a nice updraft going on to the south. So this ended up being the storm that we would originally leave for. Um, however, the storm we left for ended up really not, not really popping off like it could have. I mean, with decent thermos, you know, 1 to 2K mixed layer cape, um, we were really hoping for something. But the first cell just, it didn't have the pop. And I mean, that's probably to blame on the lapse rates. But... You know, just and also just weak dynamics down this far south. But overall, you know, you, you see an updraft base, but it's nothing very special. It's a cell that just never really got going. And so at this point, we tried catching another cell that was heading east because right as this cab broke, we had, I think, three or four cells that just all started pop, 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 moving along their own way. But the road networks just weren't good enough. This one was getting away from us, heading towards Leesburg again. And so we had to call it off. This was our final shot of that final cell. Um, with that cell that I just mentioned, and you know, not much structure, but overall, you know, it's, it's still good to get a good view of the storm, uh, part in the, the reflection in the picture. But overall, um, you know, I'm happy. I'm, I'm getting to see structure. My first year storm chasing, I'm really impressed by what I'm seeing. And this was a new one for me. I'd never seen this before. So this is where the inflow is feeding into the cell, and you got a nice view up through the storm. Uh, Mark and Peter were very happy to be seeing that, and I wasn't even sure what I was looking at at first, but. Now that I do recognize what I'm looking at, you know, that's a good sight. And so our final cell of the day, as we're honestly heading south, just getting ready to go back, one more decaying cell got us this nice remnant wall cloud. You know, telltale lowering. Uh, this slid right over us, actually, and then as the storm moved on, it popped up, and there's a nice view of its updraft. So overall, a very good chase. I'm a... Uh, very happy that I got to make the trip, and it was a really good experience, so it was a good time, you know, and I definitely had a very good day, you know. Good. Well, I'm glad that you had your priorities straight as you kept chasing, even though you got yourself hurt a little bit. <laughs> yeah, um, that stung for a good half hour. I was just, oh, it's, it's, it's all right. It's nothing bad. I bet. Um, well, I know Peter and Mark probably weren't even paying attention to you. They were just focused on the storm. I know those guys. <laughs> <laughs> to their credit, they looked at it, and it, it looked much more serious than it actually was. And they were like, are you okay? And I was like, you know, we're, we're fine. You know, let's, let's focus on this big boy supercell we got behind <laughs> us. So. Good job. Thank Thanks, you. Justin. I appreciate no that. No problem. Well, next we have up, <clears throat> excuse me, have up Roman Miller, who is uh, – actually a National Weather Service employee. I'll let him introduce himself and talk about his experience. All right. Hi, everyone. My name, as he mentioned, was is Robin Miller. And a little bit about me. I graduated from Virginia Tech in 2019. Uh, since then, I started at the National Weather Service in Wakefield, Virginia. And that's where I'm currently positioned at right now. Um, storm chasing wise, First experience of that was in 2018 as well, uh, when I went on the Hoagie Storm Chase, actually with Chris White. Uh, he was one of the chasers there as well. Um, when I was there, I was able to see my first tornadoes, and since then, I've just continued to storm chase. Let's see if I can get this sharing to work. Sorry about the delay. Uh, 
Chris, are you seeing anything? No. There you go. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about the last storm of meteorological summer. This was in August 31st, 2020. And without further ado, all right. So the setup. So there was a day three marginal over Virginia. And right here, we're pretty much looking at a chance for maybe a few rotating storms along a cold front boundary, or not a cold front, a cad front, with a warm front draped over the region and some residual typical cold front situ or CAD situation like that. We're going to have shear to the north of the front in the cold pool, and then to the south is where all the cape's going to be. So day three marginal, it stayed day three and to day one, or stayed marginal to day one, rather. But then at the 1630s, the update, which is 12.30 p.m., uh, SBC actually cut back quite significantly on any sort of tornado risk, uh, any sort of severe risk at all, in fact, because they saw that the wedge is pretty strongly held in place, and it really just looked like everything was going to stay in North Carolina. But yet we do see this one potential tornado report on the very edge of the general thunder versus nothing area of Virginia. So at that point, with that update, they also took away any chance of tornadoes. Um, just a little bit more about the potential report. There was possible tornado by public damage to a chicken coop at 2045Z. But we never were able to confirm it. There just wasn't enough damage there. So looking at WPC surface analysis, we see 12Z, the actual CAD front, is all the way down in South Carolina. It's in central South Carolina. It moves up into, nor into central to north central North Carolina by 18Z and appears to stay there through 21Z. At 10.55 a.m., I decided to draw where I thought the front was based on SBC mesoanalysis surface-based cape. And right here you can see I pretty much agree with WPC at that time. I thought it was in North Central, North Carolina. But at 2.19 p.m., we can see our very own Chris White was out there storm chasing in southwestern Virginia. And he comes across a cell near Chatham, which is starting to look a little more interesting than everything else around it. It's starting to become a little more cellular, maybe even some supercell characteristics. And by 2.41 p.m., we see that the Cape has gone north. And this little uh, buckling, so to speak, of this uh, cape lines, that's what we call a cape nose. And what we see with that is that that's the locally most enhanced area of advection. So right here, the winds are more southerly than easterly, which is a little bit further east. And that's just your greatest chance of getting a storm potential near that cape nose. And that's, right, that's the storm right in that cape nose is the one that ended up going off. So going ahead to 3.30 p.m., we see, I see a tweet from Chris White, and Storm still doesn't look that great, but it's starting to get its act together slowly near Chatham. Now by 3.45 p.m., I started to see some rotation on it and drew a little diagram. And by 3.51 p.m., now it's really starting to get going. We're starting to see lightning and a little bit of a hail core, and I'm getting ready to head out the door now because I don't want to miss out on this opportunity, considering that I thought that everything would be in North Carolina and I wouldn't have a chance to chase. By 4.39 p.m., I'd already left at this point. See a little blue at the top, I was traveling. But it starts to look really impressive. And by 4.40, within one minute, the National Weather Service office issued a tornado warning for Chase City. And at that point, you can see I was already heading down 85, trying to get in position. So by 5.29 p.m. on the right side of the screen, you can see I'm right in front of the storm in position near South Hill and La Crosse. And the storm is not exactly perfectly what you'd want to see. The rotation's kind of weakened a little bit. Uh, certainly the northern section of the storm is what's exhibiting the most rotation, but a little bit less organized than I'd like to see. And quick video right here, you can see over in the bottom right, this is my first view of the storm as I was approaching. And this is the wall cloud on the northern section of the storm. It's a little lowering. It's kind of hard to see from this video, but that was the area of interest. I'll go ahead and let the video play for a while. And you'll see I do come up on another road pretty quickly. Here we go. And you hear my reaction, hopefully. Oh, my gosh. Beautiful. Phenomenal. Absolutely gorgeous. 
So if any of you've been storm chasing and see something like that, you know that exact feeling when you just see something, it just blows your mind. And that's what we do it for, right? Seeing a giant storm in the middle of an open area where you can visualize it and take some pictures. That's what it's all about. So I start the time lapse up and you can see that wall cloud pretty much dissipates and it exhibits more outflow dominant nature and characteristics. But as it gets a little bit closer to me, you can see how I'm pretty much directly under the warm front at this time, because pretty soon you'll see here what looks like almost scales. It's from here on out, it'll look like it's scales moving. And that's just the turbulent nature between the warm air and the cold air and differences in wind shear right here. And at this point, it's just looking very interesting, but I still don't really know what's happening because I'm directly under it. So I don't have the most usable vantage point. So at that point, I almost go home, but I decide to give it one more shot. And just to recap, there's the wall cloud and alpha dominant. But I decided to give it one more shot just to see since I was already down there and try to go east. So mesoscale discussion was actually issued right at the time I got to the storm initially at 5.32 p.m. And SBC actually depicts the warm front significantly further north than where WPC had it. Remember, WPC had it through central North Carolina and SBC got it right using Cape. And it really was in South Central Virginia. Um, only thing really to note from the discussion is that it was a very marginal setup. We're talking 250 to 500 joules per kilogram of ML Cape and zero to one SRH of only 100 to 200. So that's pretty much definition of marginal. So I go a little bit east, see this, start to get a little interested. And then my next view at a neighborhood pull off was this. It went from nothing to absolute beast mode very, very quickly. And I was not prepared for that. So the next set of pictures was all taken within a 10 minute time span from 611 to 621. I pull off when I see that. And here we go, it's perfect example of a true supercell in Virginia. You see a nice farmhouse in the foreground, but just a beast of a storm. And here's my actual panoramic view of that storm at that time. You can see it's a little more impressive than when I was on it at my original position, just a tad. But got a couple more shots of the structure. And over here, the northern side was actually obscured by the rain, and that's where any potential tornado would have been, which is kind of a bummer, but it was just amazing viewing either way. No complaints from me. So I go to a field, and this is still within the 10 minute time frame, mind you. And I just look for the nearest field to me and try to get a good vantage point as it's getting closer. Cause I, I could tell it was moving slow. I didn't realize how slow it was moving. So this is my vantage point there, which I was pretty happy with. But once again, the actual best rotation couplet was in the north on the northern side of the storm, which would have been obscured by these trees to my right. But uh, this is where I get to the importance of storm chasing. So trying to find this field, I neglected the number one rule of storm chasing that Chris White himself has taught me during the Hokie storm chase, which is always have an escape plan. In my haste, I did not look at everything around me and I ended up down a two mile long dirt road with a dead end. And I didn't even know this until I did some research for this, but I was actually surrounded by a river on three sides with trees on the side where the tornado would have come through. So absolutely terrible decision. Please don't ever do that. Always make sure you're aware of your surroundings before you go down any road. Do not get trapped like that. And there's my position relative to the storm. You can see I'm on the Northern side where the best couplet was. And uh, here's something from my group chat. Good old Peter Forrester, fellow chaser, taught me a lot of what I know. And he has a picture of me right in the dead center of the couplet. Talk about me getting hooked. And then uh, famous words from Peter. Roman, Eloa, he knows what he's doing. No one should ever say that they know what they're doing because they can always make a mistake. And the response from that is down here in the bottom right, dead end. But thankfully, there was no tornado, so I lucked out this time. But just have this as a warning for everyone. And when you're storm chasing, make sure you always have an escape plan and do not get trapped down a road with a tornado warning. Uh, when I got out of all the rain because I got hit by the forward flank downdraft, uh, this is my view. Massive mezzo wall cloud obscured by the rain, which was pretty fun, but I was thankful to get out of it. So I made my way east on 58, and the storm was just to my south at this point, moving east-southeast along the wedge front, and it still looks amazing as a wall cloud. It's freaking amazing structure. So I pull off, and I see this view over here, 
But then as soon as I pull off pretty much, there was an individual who lived up the, a hill right nearby. And he called me over because he saw that I was probably a storm chaser. And he asked me some stuff about the storm. So I went over and talked to him, socially distant. And it was really good to be able to interact with the public and just tell them that they're safe. The storm's going to go to their south and all that. And he was just trying to help out and give me a better vantage point too. So um, just a little reminder, it's always better to sacrifice the best picture for the best experience and for helping others if they need help. So I ended up overshooting the storm and repositioning just south of Emporia. And this is my view there in Emporia. So I decided to annotate this a little bit. And what we see is personally my best example of a tilted updraft. You can see how with vert increasing in vertical structure of the storm, the higher up the storm goes, it just becomes more and more tilted as wind shear increases with vertical extent. And this is just pretty extreme. <laughs> To be honest with you, I was very happy with this structure, but you just see how it just goes up and occurs almost completely horizontal when you get to the upper layers. I was right on that warm front boundary and that storm is still kicking. I added the colors a little bit to this one. That's why it looks a little off, but just another example of the supercellular structure at that point. And just showing you, this just shows a little bit of lightning. It's nothing that exciting, but you at least get to see uh, a little bit of lighting. The significance of that, though, is that where I was is in this black little spot right here, which is actually not even under a chance for thunderstorms because it was supposed to be under the cold, stable air mass of the cold air damming. However, of course, I did see a supercell and lightning all in that, and majority of the tornado, the potential tornado, the report, was actually before I got to the storm. So the entire time I've been seeing the storm has been in this area that was not outlooked by even a chance of thunderstorms uh, by the 1630s of the outlook. They did update it later to include it, but that was the one I was going off of because that was the last one I saw before I headed out. So a little overview, total time on the storm was two hours and 20 minutes. I was on the storm from 5.20 p.m. to 7.40 p.m. Uh, Chris White was on the storm by 2.15 p.m., which means that that supercell had a lifespan of at least five hours and 20 minutes in Virginia. It cycled several times, fluctuating speed and transitioning from outflow dominant to inflow dominant each time, which became very frustrating because as soon as it would slow down, I wouldn't realize how slow it was going, and then it would randomly shoot forward and surge out in front of me. So it's kind of difficult to track. And I didn't realize until later that when it was really becoming um, tighter rotation, it was only moving at 15 miles per hour, which would have been a chaser's dream, but I didn't realize that because I was trying to look at the storm and drive and not look at all the radar data. So I ended up overshooting it and going to Emporia. So just some conclusions from this storm. Remember the number one rule of storm chasing, always have an escape route. Check your storm motion before you go so you don't overshoot a perfectly chaseable storm. And never underestimate a cab front wildcard setup because Although nothing always happens, nothing's guaranteed. If something forms right on that front, it at least narrows down where something could happen. And it tends to just have the best uh, ingredients with the shear to the north of the front and the uh, cape to the south. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for watching. And follow me on Twitter at WXRoman. Look for the Roman Miller photography watermark at the end. I don't know, Chris, if we're doing any questions, but I put that in there just in case. Sure. Well, that, that's just awesome. Uh, you know, that, and the one reason I, I can tell you exactly why I, I preach that to everybody, finding is make sure you have an escape route. Can you guess? Been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you always, had, always need to think ahead of the storm, where the storm is going to be 10 minutes from now and where you need to be. And, oh, my gosh, yeah, i got to have an escape route. So, yeah, that was that was an impressive storm, and, and I, same thing as you. I, that day, of course, I was out chasing, uh, chasing from the west, and I was confused by that whole uh, wedge front location myself, because I was thinking, well, there, there are probably going to be storms, you know, because in a marginal risk, I'll go out and look. But when I got out in the field, same as you, I was chasing solo, and I didn't have enough time to really access the the surface data while I was on the road to see. Well, no kidding, that wedge front was a lot further north and east than that was Prague. So when I was chasing that cell from the backside that, that you, you took over from the, from the east side, I didn't really understand until later when I pulled off the road because I ran out of, basically ran out of uh, usable routes that I could get to it, that, that I was actually on that warm front. And I'm glad you saw what you did because that was an awesome storm.
Yeah, I was really looking forward to it. I only chased it because I saw that you were on it, and I was hoping that we'd be able to meet up. A little unfortunate that you left before it started getting going, but uh, still a cool experience nonetheless. Yeah, it, it really was. So, uh, so, and then the other part of the encouraging to, uh, people too was that just because there's a marginal, just just a marginal risk, doesn't mean you should go out. I mean, I don't think you, anybody should chase just according to SPC. You know, take a look at the models, take a look at the parameters. Uh, if it looks like it's going to be a, a setup that you think there's going to be something happening, regardless of what SPC says, go look at it because there can always be that one storm that goes up. And uh, I, the what I'll cover today in here in a little bit, it was a, a storm from August 1st of this year or last year, sorry. But there were some other storms that I was on that had no business of showing hook echoes. And I was in the middle of a hook echo a couple of times. And they were one of them wasn't even a Warren storm, but it was under a marginal risk. So if you go looking, you can see some stuff. 100% and, uh, no, question for you, Roman, just before I, I go to the to the other storm I was going to talk about. Do you think um, is that particular setup with the storm you were chasing? Was that in was the structure influenced the further east you got? Was it influenced any by like sea breeze or something coming off the Atlantic? I don't think it was influenced by the sea breeze. I think what happened was right where you saw from that time lapse, as soon as it got over, basically over my head, is when it truly latched onto that warm front. And I think that's what got it going right there. That was right on the Cape nose and just followed the warm nose all the way down with a lot of, you know, it was a lot better caped in North Carolina. And so it finally, it was peak diurnal in the summer. So it really was just able to take control of that Cape and get going. I know the winds, I think they were more easterly than southerly, but it was still at least some, you know, warm air advection. So it was pretty good to see. But I don't think it was a any sort of sea breeze front interaction. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let me do a share screen here and uh, pick this up. Let's see which one do I want? I want that. And let's see. Is that up on the screen? Need to probably need to do. There we go. All right. So, how we're we looking? Can we see that? Yep. All right. Uh, this was uh, August first here in uh, in the western part of the state in Bedford County, and uh, as you can see there, I'm actually chasing with my oldest grandson. This is the first chase that he and I had done together. He's fascinated by storms and. Who knows? He, I don't know if he'll be a meteorologist, but he may wind up being a storm chaser as well. But uh, this was uh, a day that it was a weekend that uh, my wife and I were keeping our two older grandsons. And there was just a storm that came up in, in the Roanoke area that uh, we decided to go look at. But I, I had looked earlier that day and, uh, you know, Bill was showing the 500 millibar map. This was a 12Z that day. And you can see it was, a, again, a trough out over the Midwest. Uh, with some pretty decent southwesterly winds at 500 millibars, enough to give it a little bit of a, of a uh, jolt. And then the surface map, there was a, a low uh, over, uh, again, over the Midwest. With And we were kind of in Virginia here. We were stuck between an, that advancing low in fronts and then a stationary front, which also, you know, always kind of adds some interest in there as a shear zone. So SPC had the overall area, that we were that I was going to be chasing in, which is kind of here in Southwest Virginia, under the marginal risk with a slight risk further north, and uh, you, same thing with the if I pull up the uh, tornado, two percent risk was uh, just there, uh, a little bit further north than what where I was chasing. So I knew it wasn't a ballistic setup, but it was worth going out to look just because there was a storm that came by close. Now here's the um, excuse me. Here's the uh, sounding for that morning from Blacksburg. And you can see the interesting part, one of the reasons I didn't get too excited was because I could see a bit of a cap here at, uh, at see, between 700 and 650 millibars. And there didn't look like there was much there that was going to make that cap break. It didn't look like there was a, a whole lot, a lot of lift to be involved. It turns out I was wrong, but uh, we'll talk about that. So when this storm fired on the eastern, south, south and eastern side of the Roanoke Valley, uh, I grabbed my grandson and we went over to a, a local spotting area that's kind of on top of a hill. 
just I told my wife, I said, hey, we're going to be gone 10 or 15 minutes. Take a look at this thing and we'll be back home. Well, when we got there and took a look at it, it started taking some taking up some pretty good uh, shape. You know, that you see the base here and with the the uh, radar representation there. That was actually the storm was southeast of me. It was up a little, a little bit to the north of. Chris, I hate to interrupt you, but you're frozen on the title slide of your presentation. Oh, I am. There we go. It, ju it just updated back to where uh, it's a radar image and structure. All right. Well, maybe I'll just do it this way then, instead of doing that. I'll, I'll have to do something different for when I do time lapses. So this is the storm uh, looking to the to my south and southeast. And it started looking pretty good. And if you look there in the, the bottom left of the base, you see what starts looking like a little bit of an inflow. So that caught my eye. So I, I called my wife and said, we're going to go a little bit further. You know, we're going to try to get in the east side of the storm, take a look at it. So about a half a mile later, we were stopped getting ready to turn left at this light. <clears throat> and uh, my grandson took this picture. And look at this inflow that had developed within literally three or four minutes. So I knew this storm was gathering itself. And so I, I was you know, really excited about it. And we, we headed north, uh, up on, got up on 460 uh, and, and went east to Bedford. And then about an, uh, an hour and a half later, we were in position in front of the storm. It was starting to look really nice, but I was waiting for some kind of warning to be put on it. And, and I didn't see it right away. But we, we cast around for a spot. You, you can see here we're south of Bedford. This There's a road here between uh, the town of Bedford and down to uh, Smith Mountain Lake. It's uh, Route 122. And we finally found a spot just off of 122 looking west. And this is what we were looking at. Pretty nice storm. Uh, <clears throat> this was uh, coming right at us. It was basically moving toward us. Uh, the, the main road is, is about 10 feet behind us. So we were looking at that. Uh, coming at us. And I'll see if I can get this, if, if it doesn't freeze up here, see if I can get this time lapse to work. Let's uh, go from here. Can you, is that working for you guys? You can see it rotating. And it's uh, basically, it's gathering energy, you know, still coming at us. But I was still concerned about the, the, the cap. You know, I wasn't certain that the cap was going to, you know, break enough to really get this thing going. Uh, oh, I'll see if I can run it one more time. Here we go. Uh, but this storm actually kept going for quite a while. It, it um, actually went on east of us. And later on, uh, after the, the precipitation started getting close to us, we retreated south and east about, I don't know, two miles or so and watched this feature, which I wasn't convinced at the time, but I'm still kind of thinking that this may have been, there we go, this may have been a funnel uh, ahead of the main storm, which is some of the uh, updraft is still off to the left there, the base of it anyway. So I wanted to keep going, but we had already been gone. Instead of 10 or 15 minutes, we were now going on three hours. <laughs> and I needed to get back home. So this was our last view of that storm. Uh, this is looking north as, as the base was passing by left to right in front of us. This is uh, just east of uh, Route 122 there. And there were some other chasers on the storm. We waved at them as they went by. It might have been uh, Mark uh, Overbeck. I can't remember who else was out there. But this was just a, a really neat storm that went through that day. And then uh, and on the way back home, I just stopped and, and snapped this uh, photo of a uh, hail shaft on the backside of it. So uh, just to go back, let me do this here. There we go. Um, later on that day, I, I, I posted something on my uh, storm chasing blog that I was uh, one for two that day. The, the, uh, the one, the success was what I just showed you. What I missed was the tornado that happened later that evening in Botetourt County, which is like 15 miles straight line from my house. Uh, I, I was watching that storm on radar that evening and I knew it had a good chance of dropping something, but I couldn't justify leaving my wife with the grandkids again. <laughs> so, so I just kind of waved at it and let it go. And sure enough, it dropped, I think it was the EF zero tornado that. Uh, Path link wasn't that wasn't that long, but it was definitely rotating as it was going north of us. So that's my tale of woe for uh, what I missed. But it was some pretty pretty cool stuff that I saw. And as I said earlier, I had seen some other really neat storms uh, that I hadn't expected. Uh, some other things. So I consider it a, even though 
the chase season itself was cramped a little bit by COVID. Some of the storms weren't all that great. Uh, I thought I saw, we saw some pretty cool stuff. How about you guys? Um, overall, I mean, for my first year, um, it wasn't the most active year. There's definitely been more active years, but it was definitely I was sort of satisfactory, I guess. I mean, there were storms pretty frequently, especially just shelf clouds in particular. There were plenty of those, and I mean, as long as there's a storm at the end of the at the end of the day, I guess you can't complain too much because at least there's something, and beggars can't be choosers. So, I'll take everything I can get, you know. <laughs> sure. Bill, what do you think? I mean, I, I was bummed that I couldn't go out west, though if I'd gone out of my usual time looking at what happened, I, I would not have seen anything. It was a terrible year out in Tornado Alley for Chasers, that is. Uh, certainly good for the folks that live out there. Um, but in Virginia, I mean, I, I got some nice lightning pictures. I always like getting some good lightning pictures. And, you know, to be on a tornado worn storm and have a nice wall cloud, I mean, I'm happy with that. It's always good to get out and uh, go on a chase. So. I mean, beggars can't be choosers, so, you know, as you said, so hoping for good things in 2021. How about that, Roman? You got anything to add? Yeah, um, a little different. It was one of the best chase seasons for me personally, but that was also because since everything was kind of canceled due to COVID, storm chasing was kind of like, it's kind of an escapism for me. So I went out as much as I could every marginal that I was off. I ended up seeing a lot of storms right now. I'm working on a video for top 20 storms of 2020. And I saw at least 25 storms over the year and two of the top three best shelf clouds I've ever seen in my life. And then uh, that storm that I showed today. So it was a pretty fun chase season for me, but that's just because I had nothing else to do. <laughs> I understand. Well, there are some things coming up that uh, folks that are watching or that might watch this later uh, need to be aware of, one of which is next. No, I'm sorry. I'm, we're not in February yet. It'll be in March, March 15th through the 19th. There is a move, a move afoot to put together a Virginia Severe Weather Awareness Week. Um, I've been privy. I don't know, if Roman, if you heard some stuff through your office, but I've been privy to some conversations going on between the, the three main offices, weather surface offices here in Virginia, plus some te some television broadcasters. And it looks like it's going to be the first severe weather awareness week we've had in a while. I don't know when the last one was. Typically, the last few years, all we've had is a, uh, a, a tornado drill for 15 minutes for one uh, one Tuesday in March, typically. Uh, this, week, uh, this year, it's going to be an entire week. So stay tuned for more information coming out on that. The, uh, the Virginia Department of Emergency Management is on, is on board with it. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get some good information out there for not only us severe storm wackos, but also the general public uh, to, to talk about. So that's the March 15th through the 19th. And then in November, uh, we've got already on the calendar at the Science Museum of Virginia in Richmond, the 2021 Mid-Atlantic Chaser Con is scheduled. Uh, now, of course, that is uh, dependent on COVID situation calming down and things getting a little bit more back to normal. I'm sure we'll still be wearing masks and do things things like that at that point. Uh, I've put a few feelers out to some speakers, nothing firm yet, but, uh, you know, it, it's still a little early. Probably won't even start ticket sales until, you know, August-ish time, time frame. But it's November, it's Saturday, November 6th. The first uh, November in Saturday, you'll be at the Science Museum of Virginia, so you can circle that as well. We'll be putting more out on that on, uh, on my Twitter account and on uh, if you uh, follow Mid-Atlantic ChaserCon on Facebook or as a Twitter account as well as at MChaserCon, you'll, you'll get more information on that. So that's that's all I have. Any Anybody else want to throw something out there? Um, I think there's a something called a Storm Chaser Summit or something that's uh actually i think it's this weekend it's free on on saturday and i guess google it is i got a whole bunch of speakers in uh, uh i guess it's based out of oklahoma but they got folks from all around some well-known uh, uh chasers and uh i think this is one of these things where they usually it's supposed to be it's supposed to be a successor to the to the big uh chaser convention but uh, because of covid it's uh it's all virtual right now so uh, that should be fun. That's this coming Saturday. Yeah, so, thanks. Um, thanks. It. I forgot about that. Yeah, you're right. 
So yeah, that'll be that should be good. I'm signed up for that. I, I don't know if I'll sit through the, the entire thing, but I'm sure I'll, I'll see uh, see some of the speakers. So, all right, guys. Well, appreciate your time. Appreciate your efforts in putting together your talks. And hey, we we'll look forward to meeting out there somewhere on the chasing planes again. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And us, I guess, once everybody. Yeah. All right, uh, we'll uh, end this broadcast here and uh, it'll be available probably over on YouTube for a while and we'll put that out there. So thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.